Welcome to the Tri-City Herald editorial board with uh, congressional candidates, Representative Dan Newhouse and challenger Doug White. I'm Cecily Rexis, and I'm the editorial writer with the Tri-City Herald. And joining us today is Corey McCoy. He's an assistant editor at the Herald. And Mike Paoli, he is a community rep. So um, I'll give uh, I'll give each of you two minutes to have an opening statement, and then we'll get started on our questions. So I'll just start with Representative Newhouse. Uh, let me know when uh, you get going, and I'll just press the button. And Thanks, everybody with the Tri-City Herald. I appreciate this opportunity to visit with you and also with my opponent, Mr. White. Um, for those of you that are listening and may not know, know me, I'm Dan Newhouse, and I'm, I have the great honor of representing Washington's 4th Congressional District in Washington, D.C. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a, a third-generation farmer from Sunnyside, born and raised. In fact, I just came from the Hopkill to, to do this uh, interview today. Um, we're in the midst of uh, harvest time, and as you can imagine, it's a it's a very busy 24-7 for several weeks in a row. And so if I look, seem a little sleep deprived, you'll understand why. Um, my background, I served in the State House for almost eight years. I also served in uh, Governor Gregoire's cabinet as the Director of Agriculture for her second term. And then I've been in Congress since 2015. And I really ran for office initially because as a farmer, as a businessman, I was very frustrated by always finding new and different rules and regulations that I had to abide by. I felt that people in the positions of, of decision-making didn't have a, the, the right perspective to be able to um, really make the right choices when it came to, the, to central Washington, my friends, my business. So I was frustrated by that and decided to run for office. And that was one of the main issues. I've always felt that as one of my duties is to work with members from both sides of the aisle, to try to find common ground to the many issues that we face. I've been pretty successful at doing that. Uh, I think we get better solutions to problems that, that challenge this country when we can work together to, to, to come up with the solutions. I'm very proud to been able to work very hard on some important issues. Farm Workforce Modernization Act, and proud to say we passed twice through the House of Representatives. First time major immigration legislation has passed in, since 1986. We passed the Yakima River Basin Enhancement Act, uh, many other things that are very important to our district, and I look forward to a conversation with, with, uh, with all of you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Representative Newhouse. All right, Mr. White, whenever you're ready. All right. Well. Again, thank you for having me here. I do appreciate it. Um, my name is Doug White. I'm the Democratic candidate running for fourth congressional district, and I'm a fourth generation farming family born and raised in Yakima. My father retired from Hanford as a union pipe fitter, and my background is international business. I was a global project manager, and my first job was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. That's quite an eye opening experience for a, a young kid from Yakima. And I was the operations manager for a telecommunications project with 4,000 employees and 51 different nationalities. Things got complicated from there. My clients have been global leaders in their industries. I've worked with people of very different backgrounds and agendas, and it's always been my responsibility, no matter how large or complicated the project, find that common ground and bring it together on time and, of course, under budget. My overseas base for many years was Hong Kong on the footsteps of China, and I quickly came to understand the importance of the United States' role in global politics and maintaining our leadership role at all costs. Now I decided to run because I looked around and saw that we had the same problems today that my grandfather used to tell me about when I worked with him in the orchards, and that's water, immigration, infrastructure, and climate change. And I cannot fathom why our politicians have not seen these as a priority. They are vital to the success of CD4. And as we have gotten bigger, these problems have become more critical. And as we have grown, we have new problems, housing, homeless, healthcare, violence in our communities, drug addiction, and minimum wage jobs. Crazy thing is, is we used to do great things. We built the dams, we electrified our homes and businesses, we built reservoirs to water the desert, we built Hanford to end a world war and enter, enter into a new generation of carbon-free energy production. So what went wrong? Why did our representatives stop believing in us? You know, we only get one voice in Congress, you know, only one. So I got to talk to Doc Hastings a couple months back and I asked him, I said, you know, well, what's it like only running for two years? You know, it seems like you're only politicking and never getting work done. And he said something that stuck with me and he said, you know, 
two years is about the right time because that's when people get an opportunity to be able to determine whether or not you're doing things for them. And it's time to get kick them out if they're not. And I thought that was important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and it looks like um, Matt Taylor was able to join us. Thank you, Matt, for popping in. He is uh, the Herald's uh, retired editorial writer. So anyway, I wanted to get that introduction in. So I'm just going to start off, um, uh, Mr. White, you've been pretty critical of Mr. Newhouse, <laughs> Representative Newhouse. One of the things I noticed was that you were um, criticizing him for being opposed to the student loan forgiveness program after he received um, COVID farm and dairy loans uh, that were also forgiven. So could you elaborate on that? And then I'll let Representative Newhouse speak to that. Well, I think it kind of speaks for itself. I mean, you know, uh, he is one of the richest member of Congress. He is one of the richest farmers in here. You know, that money was earmarked. And I thank you, uh, Mr. Newhouse, for voting for the CARES Act that made that money available to so many small businesses, something like 11 million businesses benefited from it. But sadly, like so many of these programs, a small percentage of them, 3.6% of the loans represented close to 35% of the money given out, just under $300 billion. And Mr. Newhouse took a big chunk of that, $670,000 of it. You know, Since he's part of that track in Congress, it's almost a little bit like insider trading. Right? And so when we're talking about forgiveness of loans, I don't think it is about forgiveness of loans because obviously we're comfortable forgiving loans. If you want to speak specifically about student loan forgiveness, I can talk to you about that because I think that was handled poorly and I probably would have had another approach. Okay, um, why don't you just elaborate real quick on that? Well, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think, uh, well, one of the things is, is education has gone up at a skyrocketing rate and we don't fundamentally educate people differently than we have in the past. So why is that happening? The other thing is, we're talking to people who are young and probably not very experienced with financial products, and they're saying the only way for them to go forward is to get these easy to attain loans. I think that's problematic. And then the high cost of the interest rates is, is a problem in and of itself. And this is something that Congress should be looking at. If I was to see any forgiveness, I would have been looking at forgiveness maybe in interest rates rather than equity. And I think that would have had broader appeal for many people, and it would have been a reasonable uh, assistance for people to get some relief. Representative Newhouse, uh, your thoughts on that? On which part? The, uh, the Both, CARES Act? all of <laughs> Yeah, I think well, you can talk me... about the CARES Act and then go on with student loans. So my response is, you know, we have a citizen legislature. That's what Congress is. And the fact that I have a small business uh, should not preclude me or anybody else that has a small, bit, small business from being able to utilize tools that Congress passes. Of course, the numbers are just a little bit wrong, Mr. White. I don't even have a theory. So half of what you're talking about doesn't apply to me. But um, I didn't I, say the word dairy. Cecilia did. No. Yeah, I thought we read that on one of your um, no. social media sites. I, I, okay. I, All I right. Well, that that's good to know that. It's good to clear that up. So just, just saying. And, and the second part of the um, uh, assistance that was provided for businesses, Congress um, took themselves out of the running for that. So my son reminds me of that on a regular basis. But in, but anyway, um, I think it's totally fair that uh, in extenuating circumstances such as this country was going through, we passed some really important legislation to help small business. We didn't want our economy to go in the toilet. And we wanted to make sure that people could stay, as a, uh, keep their employees as long as possible, keep the lights on as much as they possibly could as we work through the challenges of COVID-19. As far as the student loan issue is concerned, I think that what the administration has done is a totally wrong approach. Um, these loans are not being forgiven. They're being transferred, transferred to people, many people who didn't even take out loans to begin with. The, um, I think the number in our district alone of people that don't have four, four year degrees is over 75%. And to shift, the responsibility for paying back loans that were taken about by others uh, to me just just is not fair there are, there are other things that could be done certainly the high cost of education has to be addressed and i think by providing this kind of program perpetuates the increasing inflation in tuition costs so uh, I, I totally disagree with the uh, student loan forgiveness act yeah but um 
if this is conversational, I mean, it is. yeah, you know, any any loan that's forgiven by the United States is just a shifting. I mean, that's you know, that's just a given. So that's the way that works. So one is not different than the other. Okay, let's let's talk about immigration. Um, Representative Newhouse, I'll start with you. You've um, passed some legislation uh, that uh, was very helpful. A lot of people thought. Can you explain what that is, and and then uh, we'll let Mr. White have a chance to respond on on what uh, that was. Yeah, I was very happy to be uh, part of a process in working in a bipartisan way to pass legislation through the House, like I said, twice. We've done it in two Congresses now, and it's now over in the Senate for their consideration, called the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which really does a, a, a lot of different things. But the bottom line is it, it works to uh, recognize those people that are in this country now who are working in agriculture, who don't have legal status, and provide them a, a way to become legal so that we can continue to benefit from their labors. And it looks to the future so that we can allow people to come to this country who want to, who we need, by the way, and many people in central Washington understand that, to be able to come into this country legally. And it provides uh, electronic verification so that um, people that do not have proper uh, visa in possession uh, will not be able to be hired. So I think it accomplishes many different things. Not only does it provide a source of legal workers, but it also helps reduce the pressure to come into the country illegally, because if you do, it, re it, it precludes you from being able to get a job. This is, this is one part, I think, of a larger, uh, larger effort that has to be accomplished as it relates to uh, immigration issues in this country. Certainly the the DACA issue is something I've supported and will continue to until we get that passed into law. But there are other aspects of our economy, other aspects of immigration that we have to address. Congress has not been successful in taking on comprehensive immigration reform. So the strategy that we have in place is to do this in pieces, smaller chunks, so that um, one doesn't weigh down the other. These, these important issues can be debated and discussed individually and we work, work to move forward. The, the, the great thing is we have a group of senators uh, right now that see the urgency of getting this passed. Like I said, that it's in the Senate now, and I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to get this done by the end of the year. That's one of my highest priorities. Our agricultural industry absolutely has to have not only an adequate supply of, of valuable people to help with the, the work that we have in our farms, but a legal source of workers. That's fair to the farmers, it's fair to the farm workers, and it's much better for our communities. Go ahead, um, Mr. White, you can uh, yeah, elaborate on that. To specific, specific to the, the, the um, farm workforce modernization. Yes. Act. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the most shameful things that this country could possibly do. Um, you know, I've talked to quite a few people, the agencies that run the hiring, um, I've talked to the lawyers that represent the farmers, and I've talked to the people who would be affected by this and their families that would be affected by this. The consensus is, is the Farm Workforce Modernization Act really has done nothing to improve the H-2A visa process. It's done nothing to make it less complicated, less costly, or make it more accessible to small farmers. What it does do, and this is the single most important thing to keep in mind, is it creates a subclass of people and brings in indentured servitude. We are reintroducing basically slavery into this country. We we're expecting people to come back year after year to do back-breaking work. And if they do not come back, it cancels it. They have to do this for, what, about 14 years before they are even considered for a chance for citizenship. This is not a pathway to citizenship. It is indentured servitude. And the fact that us in central Washington who know this subject so closely and intimately is somehow hoodwinking the rest of the states into believing that this is somehow a blessed way forward, I think is shameful. It really is. Yeah. Can I respond yeah. to that? Read the, bill. Oh, read the bill. So um, first of all, the legislation is not law yet. So to say that it hasn't had any impact is not fair because it's it's not in effect. And let me just remind people that this this has strong bipartisan support, support of the, not only the farmers, but also we worked very hard 
with the, the farm labor organizations as well. So it has broad, broad support on both sides of the aisle and both sides of the, the employment coin, so to speak. Uh, this, this provides an opportunity for people to, and, and I, I resent the fact actually that some people think that working on farms is beneath someone's dignity. You can make a good living. You can do really well providing it for your family. It's a great way to, to make a living and provides a lot of opportunities for people that are that maybe don't have that to opportunity where, where they're coming from. And and not, not only the opportunity for them, but for our agricultural industry, what so desperately needs needs these people. So so I, I just uh, take exception to some of the observations and perspectives that were just pre presented. I think that the, the the language of the bill speaks for itself. Is it perfect? No legislation is, but it's a huge step forward toward us as an agricultural industry and as communities not being dependent on an illegal workforce. And I think it's an absolutely important thing for us to move forward. Well, does it require 14 years of continued labor before they can be citizens? Is that in there? Representative so there's, there are requirements that if, if someone who is here right now working in agriculture can prove that they have been in the industry for a certain period of time and makes a commitment to stay in agriculture for another period of time, then they can continue to get the, uh, the, the, the legal visa in order to come and go across the border. Um, the, the thought there was, and it, it's not indentured servitude by any means, but it's, a, it's an obligation, it's a commitment on the part of the individuals so that when they get this, this visa to allow them to come into the country for the reasons that we need it in our strong agricultural uh, economy, that that commitment uh, allows them to stay in the industry for a certain period of time. We can't control what they do for their whole life, but we do, do require a certain amount of time of commitment so that, so that we match the employment opportunities with the workforce that we're bringing in. And that commitment is their lifetime, not their, basically. Not their lifetime. Yeah. And if they don't do it, then they fall out of the process and they no longer qualify for that pathway to citizenship. That's well, the that's option a, is that they, that sounds the option like, is they pay know. five to eight thousand, ten thousand dollars to a, a coyote to bring them across the border because they want to work here. Well, We're trying to provide right, a so legal now, now process. You're, so now you're actually suggesting that we should compete with something illegal activity? I don't think that's what the government should do. Okay, we're gonna move on. Matt Taylor, what's your question? I have three questions I'm going to want to ask. First, I want to apologize, but I didn't do anything wrong. It's my computer. My excuse is I'm 88. That's my <laughs> excuse for everything. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna want, I'm gonna be wanting to talk to y'all about dams, about abortion, and about Trump. What was when the last one, Matt? Trump. He said Trump. Oh, Trump. Pres former President Trump. So, how are you? Who do you want to have? Who do you want to ask the questions first, Matt? Who? I have to new house or Well, yeah, I think <laughs> I need a question. So, you just want them to elaborate on each topic. Is that it? Yes. Okay. All right. Representative Newhouse, why don't you take Snake River Downs? So I am an unabashed supporter of um, maintaining the important infrastructure that we have in the Pacific Northwest. That part of that being the four lower Snake River Dams that are seem to be in the crosshairs of some people who would like to see them breached in order to protect the endangered species of salmon. Uh, I, I, um, I try to as much as possible educate people as the importance of the dams what they bring to our region what the opportunities that they have provided from from clean carbon free baseload energy into the transportation that allows uh, lewiston and clarkston to be seaports and over 50 percent of the grain in our country moves down the snake and columbia rivers because of the barging system the agricultural op opportunities of flood control all of these different things that provide um, really our, our way of life in the Pacific Northwest, and then we become so reliant on the on the power source that they pro provide us. You know, recently uh, over the summer, we've seen record salmon returns, 
proving to me that without a question that salmon and dams can and do coexist. If, if, the, if the dams were the problem, we would, we would not be seeing this. But certainly, the, uh, I, I would be the first, many people would say, are the, are the dams an issue in some ways? Absolutely. But we've been doing an awful lot to mitigate for the, for the presence of the dams. We continue, continue to improve technology at the dams, the fish passage, which is some of the best in the world, the, the improvement on the, tech, on the design of the turbines so that they're more fish friendly. Um, we're, we're, we invest a lot into uh, habitat, predation, uh, and we should be looking at many of the other aspects, the other things that impact salmon populations, ocean conditions, the, the cleanliness of Puget Sound, the kinds of things that, that, that uh, there are many that impact salmon. It's not just one thing. If we remove the dams, even, even the scientists say there's no guarantee that that's going to bring the salmon back. We, we can truthfully say, that, like I said, dams and salmon can and do coexist. And I'll continue to fight very hard for, okay. for us to continue benefiting from their from their existence. Thank you, Mr. White. Yeah, I, I think this is a one of those areas where Dan and I, or excuse me, Mr. Newhouse and I differ, differ very greatly in our, our approach to things. Um, we've been fighting over those dams for about 70 years now. And, you know, I believe that those dams probably are not gonna come down in my lifetime. They're definitely not gonna come down in my tenure in office. And so I need to look at the things that can be done that I could do as a representative in order to be able to make this district better prepared for the future. Things that I can do is start to address uh, energy on demand, energy storage, moving into nuclear, looking for alternative ways for transportation for goods and people. And I believe in rail, I really do. Continuing to invest in our salmon runs because I do, I agree. I think that does work and it is working well. And by doing those things right now, I can start preparing for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years until maybe somebody decides that the dams actually can come down. And in the meantime, we are building up our infrastructure, we are creating jobs, and we are starting to expand our economy. These are things that we can do. So we can either stand back and do nothing and say the world is never going to change, or we can start building this economy in central Washington so that we build wealth for everybody here. This is, you know, you got to have a plan and you got to lead. Uh, if, if I might um, follow up on that, Mr. White, sure. what is your position on wind turbines? There's a lot of concern in the Tri-Cities, especially that our vistas will be marred by um, wind turbines everywhere that will just be surrounded. Um, what, what's your take on that? Well, you know, I think the, the approach to carbon-free energy production is, you know, requires a number of di different tactics. Wind turbines are one, you know, then we also have sun. And we're seeing great promise in small modular reactors. And with the benefit of having Energy Northwest, we may be one of the first states to be able to implement that in an effective way. And I'm very encouraged by that. Um, one of the things that I have trouble with is the state trying to mandate where we will and where we will not put uh, in a carbon free energy production sites. And I think that is what needs to stop because we need more input from the people. We will always be facing NIMBY. We always will, and there will always be compromises that we need, need to make in order to be able to move into the future. But I think we're a long ways from that right now. Representative Newhouse, I'll um, give you a chance to talk about wind turbines. Um, Eastern Washington seems to be the spot where, where the talk is that, that that's, that's where, where they're gonna end up. So what is your take on that? Yeah, and all the energy, as far as I know, is not even going to be staying in our region. It's going to be sending, be sent over to the west side of the mountains or to California, probably, but not certainly not in eastern Washington. And and I, you know, this may be an area where we kind of agree. I think that the local citizens should have a larger say in where uh, things such as this are placed. It should not be just. I, I understand now it's in the, in the governor's hands. It went through the FERC process. The, um, the local citizens, we, we have to look at this. We have to live with it every single day. And uh, I just don't believe that 
uh, taking, not taking our voice into consideration is the right way to go on this. And the fact remains, we are working toward the future right now. And two sides of the question here, uh, moving forward with the dams, we need every kilowatt we can produce. We need the small nuclear modular react reactors. We need, we need all of the above in order to meet the energy needs of our growing economy on into the future. We do have a strategy, we do have a plan, and the dams are an integral part of, of our economic future. And like I said, I will work very hard to maintain the, 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 the dams that we have in place. Yeah, I'll ask uh, you, Mr. White, um, what's your stand on abortion? <laughs> you know, well, Matt Taylor brought it up. I'm just proving yeah, well, he was on track. He didn't frame it as a question. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I think I think there's a, a couple of different levels here. Um, nobody's pro-abortion. They're not. And so if you're, you're actually talking about, you know, the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court, you know, I, I see it quite a bit different. One, you know, as, as a male, I definitely am not going to believe that I can make decisions on what must be one of the most traumatic experiences that a woman must face or her partner and doctor must face in the face that she's got, uh, you know, it's saving the mother over the child. What I see is this is more of a constitutional issue. You know, we have a long history in this country. We have one of the greatest documents in the world and protecting the constitution is goes above everything. But we have a problem with treating people as second-class citizens. You know, we started to talk about our seasonal workers a moment ago. You know, uh, slaves came in; they were less than people. They were property. You know, women couldn't vote. Um, then women couldn't own property. Women can't do this. You know, we've got problems with LGBT rights and various other things. There always seems to be this category of subset of people that don't enjoy the same benefits and protections under the Constitution as everybody else does. Um, I think we need to correct that. And from there, we can then start to make some of these other decisions about what needs to be done on specific issues, such as a woman's right to choose autonomy over their body. Okay. Representative Newhouse, what's your stand on abortion? So I'm pro-life, um, certainly with exceptions uh, that uh, uh, most people will accept. Um, and I think the recent court decision truly for the state of Washington is not going to make any substantive difference at all. But I think for for 50 years, a lot of people have been saying this should be a state a state decision. Well, that's what we have right now. Some states are choosing to allow, some states are choosing not to, and, and I think that's where that's just where it properly belongs. And, and like I said, um, here in here in the state of Washington, I don't see a huge amount of change happening. Uh, a woman's right to choose is going to continue here in, in Washington State, whereas our neighbor in Idaho, things are different. And so um, I think the flexibility is there that a lot of people have been asking for for half a century. But for myself, um, not not wanting to make the decision for women, uh, but I do I do believe in life, uh, and I'm a pro-life supporter and will continue to be. Matt, I'm going to switch to Mike Paoli. He can, and then we'll get back to your your third question, or Matt, third topic, I should say. Matt, this is actually this, this is actually just a clarification uh, for you, Congressman uh, sure. Newhouse. Um, you 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 spoke about uh, uh, where it belongs and the role of the state. So, for clarification, what is your position on the proposed uh, or the proposal going around for a congressional ban on abortion? Congressional ban on abortion, like I, I think the, um, I think like I said the proper place for that is is at the at the state level, and that's that's where I think it should be. Donald Trump and his political future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Representative Newhouse, we uh, know that you uh, did vote to impeach Trump, um, and maybe you can speak to that, and then what you think his future is. Yeah, and appreciate you bringing that up. Um, that was, I felt as a U.S. representative who had just a couple of days before January 6, 2021, had taken the oath of office. Uh, those words were very fresh in my mind to, to uphold the Constitution, to protect uh, 
constitution from both enemies, foreign and domestic. I felt the, the events of that day left me no choice uh, to vote for, other than to vote for impeachment. But does that mean I didn't support the president and the policies that we were able to bring forth over the four years before that? We made a tremendous amount of progress in the Trump administration on many different levels. As a, as a member of the legislative branch, being able to work with agencies uh, in the cooperative way that we with, that we had during those four years with a, was a breath, breath of fresh air. We had we had U.S. federal agencies uh, wanting to find uh, answers, yet positive answers for my constituents, instead of just finding ways to say no to many of the challenges that people face. And I, and I thought that that was a tremendously positive thing. Um, but the president. Um, well, you know what happened on on that day. It's been talked about a tremendous amount over the almost two years now. I felt I did the right thing in voting to impeach, and I've told many people this. I would do it again. I think the Constitution, the future of our country, our form of government, we have to put above partisan politics. Knowing full well that I probably risk my my political career career making that decision, and I felt it was the right the right one. Do you do you think uh, Biden won the won the election? I do. Okay, Mr. White, do you have any thoughts on uh, on Representative Newhouse's vote to impeach Trump and on Trump himself? Right. Which one do I get to speak on? Well, one, I, I I'm very grateful that uh, Congressman Newhouse did vote to impeach Trump. I do agree agree it was the right thing to do. Um, for those that you don't know, I've already mentioned my. Uh, base was in Hong Kong for a long time, our overseas base. So I was there in August uh, 2020 when the communists uh, occupied the city and I watched people get pulled out of their homes and offices in handcuffs in an instant. People that were free like us became property of the state, literally property of the state. That was one of the most frightening things that I have ever seen. And when I saw something similar happening on January 6th, that was a strong call to action. Um, you know, violence is never a way to manage the political process. It never is. Uh, with regard to uh, Donald Trump, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to put that in the past. I really am. You know, he ran up an $8 trillion deficit. He allowed China to run up uh, one of the largest trade imbalances with the United States we've ever seen. Um, he, they, uh, his pullback on foreign policy allowed China to run roughshod geopolitically and economically across Southeast Asia and Eastern Africa locking us out of many of our foreign markets, which are important to our farmers here. Um, so many things that are just created a crisis for the people here in central Washington. I'm representing the people of central Washington, not necessarily national politics or global politics. So that's what I got to pay attention to. And that's what I saw. I thank them both for their answers. They, they're, I just thought they were good answers. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay. I'd like to follow up on the uh, the China discussion for both uh, uh, for both candidates. Um, please explain, if you would, for those who will watch this video. Uh, in your words, where have we been on our China policy, uh, and why do you or do you not support where we've been on our China policy, and where do we where do you see us needing to go in the future <laughs> with regard to our uh, approach to China? Representative Newhouse, why don't you take that one first? So I, um, my understanding of our relationship with China, um, we have uh, the uh, stated uh, position of, of, of ambiguity as far as it relates to uh, our relationship with China and Taiwan. Uh, China is a um, a huge economic driver in this world, as are we. We are both um, very reliant on each other for many things. They're a huge market for many of our products, agriculturally included. Um, and they, uh, we, they depend on us for many of the things that we produce as well. So it's kind of a situation where uh, I think that we, we cannot, as, as leading nations in this world, be, be on the brink of um, breakdown as it relates to our relationships. We have to 
find ways to move forward in order to preserve um, a global peace and a an economic opportunity for, for both countries. I just um, want to follow up real quick, um, Representative Newhouse. You've been working though on um, legislation, I believe, to um, rein in the Chinese Communist Party from buying up farmland. Is that yeah. is that correct? Maybe you could speak yes. to that too. Absolutely. Um, that's that's a an issue that had come um, that I became aware of earlier this year that or last year, excuse me, but it's very concerning you know, over the last decade that uh, we've been able to keep track and the, the numbers are not as accurate as I would hope they would be. But the amount of Chinese purchases of agricultural land in the United States has increased by a factor of 10. Um, knowing full well the Chinese uh, strategy, the Belts and Roads Initiative around the globe, and their interest in securing, procuring uh, resources, natural resources, uh, building infrastructure and controlling infrastructure in other countries and in controlling farmland in other countries. You know, they have a lot of mouths to feed in China. And so I, I understand their position, but we've seen what's happened around the globe and we're starting to see that happen here in the United States. I have legislation to stop that, to, to stop the communist Chinese government from uh, in any way buying, purchasing farmland in the United States. I think it's an, a matter of national secure, security as well as food security for us to have stronger control over the food production um, that we have in the United States. Uh, just wanna, wanna say that when this was first introduced as an amendment in the appropriations process, it passed uh, with a unanimous vote. Uh, there's a lot of uh, strong support in Congress for taking this action. And I feel very optimistic that we'll be able to, to get this in, written into law. Uh, I think it's uh, a, a huge importance, uh, like noticing that, like I said, the trends that we're seeing around the world, that's something that we want to prevent happening here. Or we could wake up in 10, 20 years, given an amount of time, and wish we had done something about this when, when we don't have the control over uh, our, our domestic food supply that we, that we should. Mr. White. Uh, so, oh, yes. Uh, well, we do have to pay attention to who's investing in our country and who's buying our land, of course. But paying attention to 90,000 acres is, I think, the definition of not seeing the forest because you're too busy staring at the trees right now. China is probably, China is the biggest threat that the United States has, has ever faced. Um, I would even go so far as to say even beyond the Cold War. Cold War, we were looking at mutual destruction, but the Soviets never really had the wherewithal or capability to be able to overturn democracy because they, they're just a failed state. Um, China has both the financial capability and the structure in order to be able to absolutely be devastating. And we've set ourselves up in such a horrible position. We have been asleep at the wheel for years and years. I don't even know how long it is. We allowed our jobs to and manufacturing to be sent over to China in exchange for uh, temporary satisfaction of cheap goods. And we became addicted to cheap goods to the point where we continue to lose our jobs and continue to lose our jobs. And our jobs got depressed wages and depressed wages to the point where uh, President Biden and well, a couple months ago or something like that was actually thinking of trying to reduce the tariffs on the import of China goods because they were too expensive for the people that live here to buy. That's absolutely ridiculous, okay? China right now is very systematic in everything they do. Um, it, once you see them, that they've done it, that means that it's already in place and it can't be done. They never back down from anything. The only thing that they do understand is a show of force and strength. I am very proud of our military and our military needs to stand up. Having lost Hong Kong was devastating. And I know all eyes right now are on Ukraine and how the United States responds to that. And I am very proud of the way the United States has stepped up to the Ukraine because right now the next, uh, the next target is gonna be Taiwan. And if Taiwan falls, we lose Southeast Asia. That is the, that right now is the fastest growing area of the world with the strongest economic engine. And we need that to be allies with the United States for our trade. You know, China needs to be taken to its knees. Absolutely. Okay. 
One thing I might add on that, Cecilia, is you know, China thinks in long term. They're, they're, they have plans going out decades. In the United States, that's one area where we fall short. We don't see far enough ahead, plan far enough ahead. Our strategy is it's much more short term. And for there could be a lot of reasons for that. But I think that that is that's something that we in this country need to be aware of. Uh, what we're dealing with here in, in, in communist China. Uh, they're very, very smart, very clever people. They have their own interests at heart, not ours. And like I said, they're thinking in terms of decades, where we we're, we think in increments of two to, to six years. Um, and, and I think that that, that is uh, something that is uh, a very serious issue that we need to change in the way we strategize in the United States. Exactly. It's also about investment in our country. Uh, they invest about $8 trillion a year in infrastructure. That's trillion with a T. And we're choking on $58 billion a year investment in our infrastructure. And our infrastructure hasn't been significantly updated in over half a century. So, you know, the way they see the future is clearly different than us. So, Representative Newhouse, can you speak to um, inflation? That's been a topic just every citizen's going to the grocery store and seeing higher prices. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that trend right now? Yeah, um, it's very concerning. I think that's uh, the economy and inflation is probably top of mind for every single person in the country right now. Every time you drive by a gas station, you see posted the high price of gasoline, uh, going to the grocery store, you sticker shock it every, every single time. Um, people are having to make very difficult decisions on whether they put gas in their tank, put food on their table, buy their prescription drugs, making choices that they shouldn't have to be making. Um, so there's, and, and this, a lot of this has just happened in less than two years. And I gotta, I've gotta believe that many of the pressures that we are seeing, the inflationary pressures that were, have brought this to bear so quickly are due to policy decisions coming out of the Biden administration. Uh, we've seen the, the pressure on the uh, cost of energy from day one, uh, from decisions being being made that have made Americans, American energy less competitive, less, less available, driving up the cost. And we're, and we're seeing the results of those actions those actions right now that has to change as you know I, i'm chairman of what's of something that's called the congressional western caucus it's a group of 80 members of congress of, of congress and we focus on many of the things that are important to rural america uh, such as we have in the western united states and one of the biggest things parts of that are the natural resources that we have in this country the ability for us to again be uh, uh, export energy, uh, the energy dominant in this world, I think is a position that we have to strive for again uh, in order to make energy more more affordable for each and every American. The ability to, um, while continuing to um, um, keep in perspective our envir environmental protections, which we have to protect, we, we have to allow um, our ability in this country to uh, utilize the resources that we have literally right under our feet, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's critical minerals, many of the things that we're going to need to move on into the future. Many, many people are saying we're going to, we won't even be able to buy a internal combustion engine in the state of Washington by 2035. There's no way we're going to do that if we're relying on sources for many of these critical minerals, such as Russia and China for many of the reasons that we just talked about. So I, I think take, getting these inflationary pressures under control starts right here. We have to, we have to look at our energy. Okay. Mr. White, um, inflation. And, and, and inflation. <laughs> well, nobody likes it. That's no, for sure, right? right? Nobody mm -hmm. likes it, right? You know, I, I think it's an outrage that people that live here and work here can't afford to buy the things that they make and grow here. Right. So I just mentioned the trap that we got in with China and exporting our jobs. You know, that needs to reverse and we need to start spending money on our infrastructure so that we can actually bring jobs back so that people here can afford to buy the things that we make here. And we're not dependent upon 
foreign countries and foreign uh, corporations in order to be able to basically meet our day-to-day -day and basic needs. You know, I, I'm really upset with the oil companies and Congress's lack of dealing with them. Right now, you know, they're recording record profits right now. That's okay. I got nothing. I got no problem with profits. But I happen to know the United States has been their best customer for 100 years. I mean, we've paid. And as a businessman, I know that when one of my clients gets into a little bit of trouble and they've taken care of me for a long time, I figure out how to make it a little bit easier on them. I don't take advantage of them, right? But that's what's been happening right now. So I don't understand why Congress hasn't stepped up and just yanked that chain and said, you know, we need some help here. You've got excess profits. We need to find a balance. We need to find a solution here. And when we get to the other side, well, then we'll be happy again because this will pass. So I, I, Congress just way too weak on being able to control inflation and holding some of these corporations accountable. Unacceptable. Was there any other questions from the board? Mike, did you have something? Yeah, for both uh, candidates, where does uh, COVID-related shutdowns uh, with regard to current supply shortages, how does that figure into your calculus for blame for current inflation vis-a-vis -vis the current or the last administrative administration and their leadership? Well, you know, I, I, I've already said, I, I've already shared that, uh, you know, China enjoyed one of the largest trade surpluses with the United States and continues to do so, especially during COVID, because they were the major manufacturers of all the medical supplies that was exported and <clears throat> to the United States to help us get through COVID. And the trade war there was actually another boon to China as well, because they just circumvented by going through Hong Kong, Malaysia and various other ports. So there was really no slowdown on that. It was actually just a slush fund for them. And, you know, and again, I go back to the fact that, you know, during COVID, uh, we were not prepared in order to be able to meet the needs of this particular country. And we were too dependent on others and they took advantage of it. And it cost us billions and billions and billions of dollars and probably slowed the progress of us being able to get over it as well because we were not able to respond. And I can't think of how many lives were probably lost because of, the barriers of just getting goods in as well and being able to have access to them. I, I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but you know, that's how I feel about it. It, it you, you touch on it like uh, Congressman Newhouse follow because it all kind of comes up out of uh, the Congressman's comment about uh, inflation being a resulting factor of the Biden administration. And hence, I'm just looking at where do the COVID shortages fit into this calculus? Okay, well, I, I would like to add something there because um, COVID was a pandemic and we've, we've never done this before. And I, I hope we don't ever have to do it again. I mean, it's, I mean, it put extraordinary pressures on us that I, I'm really surprised and amazed and grateful that we got through when the majority of our workforce had to work all of a sudden from home and our children were educated from home. I couldn't figure out, I seriously could not get my head around how we were continuing to feed people, much less be able to keep anything stocked in the stores and manage any kind of supply chain. I think that is an extraordinary testament to us as people and how well we work together when we have to in order to be able to keep things going. So rather than talk about how bad we did during it and how bad the supply chains and what that effect is, I, I, I am just astounded at the capability of people. Seriously. Thank you. Congressman, COVID, the president, and inflation. So, um, well, a couple of thoughts there. We're still, you know, like I said, at the onset, we're uh, finishing up our, our hop harvest. It is still very difficult to get some of the parts and pieces of equipment. Uh, some things, if you ordered them today, they wouldn't come in until well after harvest time. So we're still experiencing those shortages of supply chain issues, um, whether domestically or from foreign sources. It's very difficult still. Uh, so it's still with us. Um, the I would I would agree that uh, we are resilient as a country to the best we can, uh, but I think that. That, that we did the best we could have under the circumstances and, and 
it was, uh, certainly a lot of people lost their lives over the over the pandemic, which is a, a, a terrible loss. Our economy has suffered greatly. Uh, the world economy has as well. It wasn't just here in the United States, as you know. But uh, I don't know, Mike, if your question is putting blame on one president or the other. Was that? Uh, specifically, does uh, reference an earlier comment, does the blame for current inflation lie heavily on the Biden administration or uh, is, did COVID and shortages have anything to do with that? Um, I, well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a complicated, um, uh, many of the factors that are contributing to inflation. Um, certainly, I think energy is one of the major drivers. And by the way, if oil companies are making record profits, they're not reinvesting them in future production because of the um, inability to secure the permitting for new new sites, new pipelines, the kinds of things that give industry certainty uh, to allow that kind of investment to happen. So I'm I'm worried about the future as as this administration wants to drive us away from the use of fossil fuels by making uh, overly expensive. Um, but I think probably, yes, uh, COVID-19 has a, an inflationary pressure, but also much of the uh, really out of control spending by the federal government in, in inserting so much capital in into the markets at a time uh, such as this has truly contributed to, to inflation. Uh, certainly, we mentioned the CARES Act early on in, in the interview. Uh, we, Congress responded what I thought was uh, rightfully so in order to prevent the economy from, from literally tanking. And I think we took these things just a little too far by, by in, in, in putting so much money into our economy and look what's, what's happened since then. We continue to do that. The, the Biden administration, the democratically controlled, controlled Congress, continues to want to do that, and uh, I think that we're paying the price right now. Uh, I, I just was reading just today about how the, the, the affordability of new homes for individuals, someone will have to save just for the down payment between ten and twenty years in order to afford a home. That's putting the American dream out of the reach of most young, hardworking Americans. And I, I think that we definitely have to do something to change that. I wanted to get you both to briefly talk a little bit about the current housing crisis. So this area, we all know, has an issue with affordability. New home prices, the average price has risen more than $150,000 in the past three years alone. And apartment rent is already averaging about $1,200 a month for a one bedroom. So how do we tackle that with thousands of new jobs still being brought to the area every year? Yeah, the competition for housing is going to continue to grow. It's, it's, it's wonderful that we have so many people looking at Central Washington. It's a, it's a great place to locate businesses. It's, it really is, but it does cause some challenge. Uh, infrastructure is one, keeping the highway system up to, up to be able to handle the increased traffic. Housing, Corey, is a huge part of that issue. Uh, one of the reasons we're seeing so many homeless people around the country is the lack of uh, affordability uh, as it relates to housing. And just as Michael was talking about some of the inflationary pressures we saw in the lumber industry and the cost of lumber that goes into a, home, uh, a new home has, has skyrocketed and every other aspect of the construction continues to go up. And so by, by us uh, addressing the inflationary pressures that we've talked about, all of those things will help to relieve the, the pressure on inflation and hence the cost of housing. I think we have to uh, look at alternatives as well. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, Americans' perception of the dream home uh, has been and uh, has evolved. It, uh, maybe it has to evolve some more and uh, what people can uh, realistically expect to, to be able to afford has, has changed. And so we have to be able to look at positive alternatives for people to be able to invest in so that they can, can realize the American dream. And Congress has a role here, we truly do. Some of the policies, it, the, the White House has a role certainly as well. Some of the policies that are put into place that address these inflationary pressures, I think it's something that we really have to spend a lot of time with. 
Okay, Mr. White. Yes, uh, housing is a crisis. I mean, it. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the with the homeless, but now we're creating a whole new set of homeless, and those are people with what we consider to be good jobs who just can't can't find a place to live. Uh, this this is absolutely a crisis. Uh, I think it's somewhat complicated. Um, part of it is because of the fact that you know we're very good at, about creating. Uh, minimum wage jobs, but we're not really good at creating family wage jobs, which means attracting new industry into this district in order to be able to give people vertical growth in their positions and higher wages. You know, I used to see union wages in this district. In addition to that, I, I do agree with uh, Representative Newhouse and the fact that at some point people are going to have to start rethinking what they, what that American dream, what that uh, forever home is looking like. You know, as long as we continue to expand where everybody wants one house on, you know, one eighth of an acre and so forth, it's going to be very, very difficult for us just to even be able to provide services, whether or not it's transportation, water, uh, electricity, and various other things, and not mention emer emergency services. So I think as people, we need to, in this district, we need to start thinking about how we reshape our communities. I mean, we right now are a collection of rural communities. We really are. We're rural communities facing big world, big city problems. And I think this is where collectively the representative can come into big play by going up and down the district as I do often and talking to these people and understanding what kind of solutions they're doing, what kind of problems they're facing and seeing if collectively we can't come up with something that looks like a solution and that's where we go to Congress. We pass the legislation in order to bring our tax dollars back home, if that's the answer, to invest in ourselves. I think that's how that happens. This is for Mr. White. Mr. White, would you uh, agree with the characterization of yourself politically as a conservative Democrat? <laughs> sure, I'll go with and, that. And yeah. um, the follow on question is, uh, why have you chosen the Democratic Party? I chose the Democratic Party because I believe in the principles of the Democratic Party. I believe that tax dollars should be spent on our country and its people, not on the wealthy and corporates. I believe that we build things from the bottom up, not trickle down. So I believe that the fiscal responsibility tends to be um, doing things that are also morally correct. I really do. Um, you know. These are just some of the things. Makes sense to be a Democrat, in my mind, anyway. I, I appreciate that for both candidates. I asked the question because they're, 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 we've, I've seen a lot of alignment on a number of the issues here. Thank you. Well, we are, we are out of time. This went really fast. I thought. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, since we, since Representative Newhouse went first on the opening, we're going to let Mr. White go first on the, on the closing. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, my closing is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I'm currently under attack by, by push polls right now that are saying some of the most scandalous and low and base things about myself and my family. In fact, all history polls. I don't think I've ever seen accusations probably this disgusting. Um, obviously, um, they're coming from supporters of Representative Newhouse. I hope they're not coming out of his campaign specifically, but um, I'm calling on him. I'm actually demanding him to put an end to this, make a statement against them, and I would like an apology to myself and my family. I, uh, seriously, I cannot tell you how disgusting these things are, these attacks against myself and my family. And they are untrue and they are unwarranted and this cannot be part of politics. I understand politics gets gets difficult sometimes and we get tough. This is a whole level of horrible. All right, Representative Newhouse, whenever you're ready. Well, thank you, Cecilia, and thanks everybody for the opportunity today. I appreciate that. Uh, I believe that um, I am truly the best fit to continue representing Central Washington in Congress. You know, my life, my professional experiences, all of those things have given me what I believe the knowledge uh, to be able to understand the unique issues that we face in, in central Washington. Because uh, frankly, the issues here are my issues. You know, I run a business, I provide jobs. I've had to navigate through endless red tape doing those things. And, and I think I've been able to demonstrate serving as a wide steward, a wise steward of the lands that, uh, that I depend on. 
you know, agriculture is a driver of our economy in central Washington. And truly, it, it, many people don't know this, but I'm one of only a handful of farmers in uh, the House and the Senate in Washington, D.C. So I think it's truly critical that we have a representative in Washington who understands our area and our way of life. And my goal has always been to advance solutions for our area that will, um, and that will continue to be my main focus. Um, I'll, I'll, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, certainly we need it lasting, meaningful immigration reform signed into law. I'll continue to protect the Snake River dams. I'll continue to promote uh, tax and economic policies that foster economic growth and job creation. And I'll work hard to enhance water storage and completing the Columbia Basin project. And I will continue also to continue educate my colleagues on the importance of the Hanford uh, cleanup funding that we, we need so badly in central Washington. So with all these reasons, I think I'm the right candidate for the job and appreciate very much your, your new opportunities. And, and I'll, I'll just address real quickly, Mr. White, I honestly have no idea what you're talking about. It's this is a surprise to me, and, and I'll I'll look in. I have no no clue, honestly. Um, but uh, I agree. This uh, the campaign should not sink to the level of what what it is you're describing, and um, it's unfortunate. Yeah, and a statement and apology that would be helpful. All right. Thank you very much. We both appreciate you. We appreciate you both for participating today. So thank you. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, you. thank you.